Well, welcome to all of you joining us in the room and online. So glad you're with us. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are going to continue in the series we've been in on the book of Galatians. But before we do, I, I want to take just a moment and just be your pastor. Uh, and and it specifically, what I want to talk to you about is this. Uh, is the conflict, the war with Israel and Hamas. So many of you have reached out, called, emailed. I've seen you and asked questions. And a lot of folks are really trying to figure this thing out. And so I'd like to take a couple of minutes and just talk to you from my heart to yours. First, a couple things you need to know. One, I am not a geopolitical expert. Uh, secondly, I am definitely not an expert on the complicated situation that is the history of the Middle East. Uh, but every week, uh, me and the other pastors here, we try to give you Jesus and try to give you what it is that he wants for you both now and in every moment. And so that's what I, I want to do with you for a couple of moments here. Uh, this past week, our session, the leadership of this church, we gathered together and we prayed about this situation. And we prayed not just for what's happening there, but what's happening here, because from my vantage point, here's what I see, is a lot of folks who are really scared. People who are asking questions like, is this the end of the world? And where does this fit into prophecy? And what does this all mean for my future? And how do I even live now? And who do I trust? I, I don't know which news outlet has the right thing, and I'm confused. And so there are a couple of things that I just want to say we all know. One, what we see happening is the fruit of evil. Uh, there is no doubt that acts of terrorism are awful and evil and they have to be dealt with. And then we also know this, that there are people made in the image of God with dignity and the sanctity of life that all humans are created in that live in Israel. And we know that there are people made in the image of God with dignity and the sanctity of life that all people have that live in Gaza and in the West Bank and in the Middle East and in Orange County, right? And what we also know is that every person that does not know Christ, and that we got lots of Christian brothers and sisters that live in that part of the world, but there are many that don't know Christ. And if you come to the end of your human time, your death without knowing Christ, your eternal trajectory is set. And that is heartbreaking as well as the horror that we're watching here. And so we pray for that. We pray for God to intervene and to bring peace we pray for a cease to violence. We also pray for those who don't know Christ to come to know him, that somehow our God would use this to bring people to him. And we believe that our role doesn't change. See, so some of you are, are really afraid and you're asking, like, is this the end times? Can I be honest with you? Um, yes. Now, I don't know if it's the end times like five months from now or 500 years from now. I know that we're closer than we've ever been, and I know that everybody who's set a date and predicted it so far has been wrong. So I don't do either of those things. I also know that Jesus has a lot to say to us about whatever time we live in. Uh, in Matthew 24, in this one place, he said, you know, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son of Man know the time that God has chosen for this. Not even he. But then he gives us this instruction. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Some translations say terrified. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various parts and places in the world. And all these are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus, even 2,000 years ago, says, expect it, but know that your job description as my follower doesn't change no matter what's happening. So here's one thing I know. I'm not sure if the end of time is coming in the next few weeks or not, but I know that for all of us, we're all living in our own end times. Because like at your best, you got, what, 80 more years? <laughs> so we're at the end. And so what do we do between now and then? How do we live? I can promise you, Jesus says, not with fear that you live with the hope of the gospel, that those birth pains mean that something is breaking into this fallen, broken world where things like this happen on the regular. 
And that thing that is breaking in is the new creation that God has made that Jesus inaugurated when he got out of the grave. And so we'll use, and this is my ask of you, that as St. Andrew's, the community of faith, we'll use not all of the division and all of the interpretations. We won't use that stuff to make us divide up. We'll use it to proclaim that the Savior of the world invites any and all who would come to come find life in him because he desires that none should perish and all should come to repentance. Can we agree on that? So we'll work for that. But here's the thing. We got to know how do you do that in times like this? How do you have the power and how do you know what to do? And that's what I'm going to address with you today from the book of Galatians. Now, it's a bit of a pivot from where I was going to go. So on your bulletin, it says Galatians 4. Like, that's just garbage now. You don't have to worry about that. We're going to jump around a little bit, though. If you've got a Bible or you've got a device, we're going to start in Galatians 3, and then we're going to go over to Galatians 5, okay? So you can jump in there. Before we do that, though, uh, I want to share with you this quote, because this is what it's all about today. And the quote, I'm not sure if I like it or if I hate it, but I think it's true. It's from a guy named A.W. Tozer, and here's what he said. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, the one that Paul's writing to in this book we're studying, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. The point is that once Jesus came, and I'm going to recap the last few weeks, once Jesus came and began this kingdom through his life, death, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit has come and is now available and living in his church, and that's how we live out faith. So let me back up in case you haven't been here. Real quick recap. Uh, We said that here's the way that you come to find faith. It's one of two religions, and there are only two religions in the world. There's done and there's do. There's work real hard, keep the rules, all the other stuff. Every other religion is a do religion. And then Christianity stands alone as the done religion. Christ did it for us. And all that's required for our justification, that's what we looked at last week, our being made worthy to be in a relationship with God is for you and I to trust, to place our faith that God's grace to allow Christ's life to become ours and his death to be enough to cover our sin and his life to be given to us, we just trust that. And that simple act of faith is what justifies you. What happens at that moment is that God of the universe says, okay, I declare you legally, you are now right with me. Not because of what you did, because of what my son did. But now you're right, and so let's get on with it. This thing called life. And what happens next is he gives the Holy Spirit to come and not just, not just help you and me to live in us. This is crazy. The Holy Spirit is not just like an animating force, you know, like in the Star Wars movies. It's not just that, but he is powerful. Notice I said he, it's a person, it's the third person of the Trinity. We understand that God is one and there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God himself says, now that you're right with me, I want to come be closer than close with you. And he lives inside you and me. And once that happens, we now are empowered and enabled to live the life that he's called us to. That's where we find freedom. He sets us free. And I want to show you in these passages, free from what and free for what. Ready? No. Thank you. Somebody's ready. Let's go. Uh, Galatians 3, starting in verse 1. Paul's real nice. You foolish Galatians. Some, some translations say, you sweet idiots. <laughs> Who has bewitched you? It's like perfect time, end of October spirit and bewitched. Who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. So I want to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit, what I just described to you, by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh, like your own power? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? In other words, is God doing these incredible things among you because you're just such good kids? Or by your believing what you heard? 
So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here's where we begin. Paul says basically this. Do you not understand the power, the value of what you have? Uh, I've told you before, Jessica and I think that Antiques Roadshow is a pretty cool way to fall asleep at night when you can't fall asleep. Just put that on, five minute, low commitment. Always fun to see what comes out of that. I was watching one the other day, it was uh, on the BBC side, so it's this lady in England with a super cool accent, and she's bringing her stuff to get valued, and she has like these brooches and pendants and hair things, and the guy's like, oh yeah, that's great, that's 700 pounds, that's 500 pounds, but could I see that necklace that you're wearing? And she's like, oh, this old thing, it's rubbish. And she like hands it to the guy. I didn't plan to just do that. Uh, She hands it to him and he explains the provenance behind this thing. And he's like, this is worth 750,000 pounds. And the woman's like, it's been just hanging around my neck for two decades. I had no idea. I've left it places and picked it up. I take a shower with it. Are you kidding me? This value that she had right under her nose, she never knew. In essence, Paul is saying the same to you and me about the Holy Spirit. Do do you not understand that you have actual God himself living among you? Do you not know that the empowerment that he gives, the guidance that he gives, will help you to know how to walk through any time, including massive conflicts in parts of the world that you can't control and you can't explain? And he says, there's miracles that are happening among you. How do you think you got that? You know what's really cool? Um, God is doing some amazing things here. Uh, I can tell you stories about miracles that have happened here at St. Andrews. And I just want to share a couple with you just because I think it's super encouraging. Several months ago, uh, a lady came here, and I met her in between services, and she says, hey, I got to talk to somebody. Uh, Last time I came to church was 1985. It's been a little bit, and I was driving here today, and I I have to tell you, I got ticked off because there was no parking space for me in the handicap slots, and I'm like, I'll take that problem all day. Um, we, maybe we need some more parking, but still, I was really, really glad that it was, it was a good full day. And she said, uh, I almost left. I started driving away, and I just felt like, I don't know, it felt like, I guess God said, I have something for you. She's like, so I turned around, I came back, and, and when I walked in that atrium right there by the coffee shop, God healed me, just like that. And I was looking at her, because she's standing normally, and I'm like, what, what did he heal you of? And she's like, oh, I've walked with a cane for 20 years. And I'm looking at it, there's no cane. She's like, I walked back and put it in my car across the street at Harbor because there's no parking. <laughs> and I'm back today and she goes, what's happening around here? That is the Holy Spirit of God. That's no sermon, right? That's, that is the kind of work that God is up to. Whenever we live lives like this. Another lady, Anita, she comes to our first service. Last year, Christmas Eve, she's walking out the doors, going home to have the the roast beef or whatever that night, and she goes, can I get prayed for? I've had asthma that's been killing me for over a decade. A couple people prayed for her. Now, every week, uh, she walks in and she goes, still got it. He healed me. Like, I, I don't know. Paul's like, do you not see the power, the value of what you have? Are you going to try now to to earn all this stuff or to to live in your own strength and power? You sweet idiots. (laughs) So he says, I want to show you what it looks like to live a life in the Spirit. In Galatians 5, this is where we skip over. Galatians 5 verse 16, he's going to describe it a little bit. And can I say this, those are miraculous things, and we pray for healing all the time, and some of you need that, and I really, really believe that God is able to do anything, and that for many of you, he is going to heal you at some point, and in some way, we believe, and we trust that, and we trust that even when he doesn't, that he is walking with you in power and presence too, that he hasn't left you, but those things, can I be honest, are not the most miraculous things that happen here. Let me, let me show you what it is. Paul says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Flesh simply means like your natural inclination, the way, your normal capability, just in your own strength, with apart from God, apart from the Spirit, just what you would do. 
So he says, don't gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So there's a conflict that's going on in us all the time. There's a war that wages in you between these two, the flesh and the spirit. And he says, they're in conflict so that you're not to do just whatever you want. In other words, and I know this is really hard for a 21st century Westerner to hear, but not everything that you feel is right. Not, not everything that you feel is so natural means it's right or good for you. He says you have to realize there's a, a war happening And so if you're led by the Spirit, you don't find yourself underneath the law anymore. Here's what that means. Um, When I got here a year or so ago, I decided that I wanted to uh, try to actually learn how to play this stupid sport called golf. And I just like mess around with it, you know, before. And now it's like because so many of you do and you look so cool with all your stuff and the way you play. I'm like, "Ah, I want to do that. I want to meet them where they are, you know. And, uh, and so a friend gave me this copy of this book. Anybody know what this is? Ben Hogan's Five Lessons. Classic. It's like the rules. It's the illustrated, like how to put your hands on the club and how far away to stand and uh, where your shoulders should go, swing plane, all, right? You know this stuff. Of course. Uh, we're in Newport Beach. So, so I read through that, but then you like go out and Everything that feels natural for me to do as a former basketball player is wrong. So everything I tried, like, it's, it's not working right. And that was an amazing thing to have this, and I could learn some from it. But then this person, like, so generous, instead, not just that, he got me some lessons with an expert with a coach. And, and then it's like, oh, no, no, your hands are almost right. No, but put them here. Stand here. Open this up. It doesn't really matter what the point is. This could be about cookbooks and a chef. The point is with a coach that has the power and the understanding to show you how to do this, everything changes. You can get really lost and really frustrated trying to follow the rules and the picture, and all you actually need is someone that can come along beside you and say, move here, do that. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John 16 that he would come and he would empower us and he would guide us into all truth, helping us to discern. So some of you are like, I don't know what to think about this situation right now. And here's what I want to tell you. If you're a follower of Jesus, stop asking everybody else for their opinion and reading all of the stuff that you can find that's just making you anxious and fearful and ask God the Holy Spirit that lives inside you, do you not know what you have? There's a coach right there. And he's more than just a coach. He actually empowers us, but first, he guides us into truth. And so so here's what he says. Here's how you know the difference between the things that are of the flesh and the things that are of the spirit. Galatians 5.19, he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Okay, hold on for a second, because remember I told you a few weeks ago, when we got into this series, eventually we were going to offend everybody. So if it hadn't happened yet, Today's your day. (laughs) Acts of the flesh are obvious. Everybody can see it. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy. Hello, Orange County. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Paul says all this stuff, things that you can see and things that you can't. By the way, does this describe kind of the world at large? Right? Can I also just remind you that this was written in 49 AD? Like we think things are awful right now. Read some of the stuff on the list. Humans have been doing this according to the flesh all of history. So he says, all that stuff is the way that your natural inclination, your normal response, what just feels right to you, that's what it will lead to. And that's why we see the world in the shape that it's in. And I warn you, as I did before, that if you live like this, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when I was a kid, and maybe you are like this too, um, that kind of idea, these lists, they're called vice lists in the scripture that would say something like, and those who do these things won't inherit the kingdom of God. That was always used to say, like, see, if you do these things, you don't get into heaven. And, and there's a, 
in a sense, that's really true. But I think there's a deeper meaning to this that Paul is trying to get at. And here's what he's saying. If you constantly live your life according to the flesh, not only not only are you not inheriting the kingdom of God, you don't even want it. Because if the kingdom of God is about such things as well, he's going to tell us in just a second. If it's about a way of life that follows what God's intention was for us across all of the aspects of being human, and at every point you want to do it your own way, you're not going to enjoy heaven very much. You're not going to like the kingdom of God very much. What we're doing, what the Spirit's doing in us is making us the kind of people that could live in the kingdom of God. That's why it's so hard. That's why it feels like war. Because he's got to teach us and train us to stop saying yes to self and start surrendering to the Spirit. And when we don't, we get all of that stuff. So Paul says, let me show you a better way. Let me show you what the way of the Spirit is. And it's in verse 22 and following. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Notice uh, in the other stuff, they were actions of the flesh, acts. Stuff that you do, the fruit of the Spirit, fruit is produced. Even in that way, it's the difference between you working on your own versus God working in you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. No limit on how much of this you can do. Do as much as you want. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. We talked about that last week. We put that old man to death. And, and then since we live by the Spirit, I love this verse, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And then just because Paul knows how we are, he goes, and let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You know why he throws that in there? Because just about the time you start living this way pretty good, being patient, kind, generous, humble, forgiving, all that stuff, you get really, really proud of your humility. (laughs) And he's like, remember, don't get conceited when the Spirit starts working in you, because you'll kill each other. So how do we do this? Like, great. There's got to be some way that you and I experience this life because this is the mark of a mature believer like this this might hurt a little bit but I promise all of the things like you can say I have walked with Jesus for 20 years and I go to all the Bible studies and I know the Bible here and there and I know Greek and I've got doctrine down and I could win at Bible trivia all day and Paul would go that's awesome how you doing in patience How's your joy? This is what it looks like to be mature because this is what happens. It's the fruit of the Spirit of God in us. So the way that we get it is self-surrender. It's choosing every moment that he says, go this way, to say, I'll do that. Now, that sounds so simple, but I want you to just replay your last week. Were there moments in your life where you felt like you're sitting across from the person that's like, you know, just the really annoying person that you have in your life? Everybody has one. If you don't have one, you're the one. You've, you're sitting across from it, and, and it's at work or whatever, and you're just like, mm. and, and there's this little voice that's kind of like, be kind. That's not the flesh. That's not your natural way. That's the voice of the Spirit of God in you. Every time you're sitting there from the person that hurt you, that deserves, like, your vengeance, that that they're wrong, and you have the opportunity to either remind them that they're wrong or to settle the score, and you have that little thought, it just, like, it flies past, right? It's just a little thought that's like, just forgive them. Let it go. That's not the flesh. That is the Spirit of God. Folks, that is God talking to you in the moment. Do you know what you have? It's incredible power, incredible value. In fact, this power, Dallas Willard says, is what God is up to. It's it's creating us to be the kind of people that he could give more power to. 
that he could allow that power of the Spirit to come through because we've developed a character that can handle it, that can use it. It's kind of like uh, if whenever you gave your kids the car keys at 16, and the first time, like you got to make sure before that, before you give them that power, that they have the ability to handle it. That's what the Spirit is doing in us. This is why it's maturity. Because here's the thing, I believe that God wants to do incredible things in us and among us, but he doesn't do it until we become the kind of, become the kind of people that can handle it. And so that's the life of following Christ. That's why we do the path. We're learning these practices, these ways to put us in position to hear God's voice and to act. If you want to have your own way, if you want to submit to self-will, you get that first list. But if you want to surrender to the God that's in you, you can have the second. And I know you. You want the second. You want joy. You want peace. You want to be a more patient person. You want to be the kind that can forgive, that stuff rolls off of you, that doesn't get, you don't want the fear that people are walking around living with right now. You want to be able to say, I get it. The world looks awful. Stuff is falling apart. But my Jesus said that he, at the end of the day, wins. And so I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm not going to divide up. I'm not going to sacrifice the unity of the people that have the spirit living in us for a perspective or an interpretation of an event. No, that's not us. We have something more, and it's more important. This is the real miracle. I love it when God heals somebody's asthma. You know what's more miraculous is when a regular old human being grows in love and peace so much that the people around them notice. That's miraculous. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it like this. Fruit is always the miraculous. It's always the created. It's never the result of willing, but always of growth. And the fruit of a spirit is the gift of God, and only he can produce it. But you and I have to choose to cooperate by submitting. So, I was thinking maybe we would end our time together, just us friends, by praying and asking God to help us to submit. Because, look, the unity in the church it depends on it. Our witness to the world depends on this. Whether or not our kids choose to take up the faith that we are practicing and talking about, whether they choose that, it depends on us growing in these things, walking and keeping in step with the Spirit. If we don't, they'll say, nah, I got a better offer. Our world needs this. You and I need this. So would you just close your eyes and I'm going to pray, but I want you to pray too. Like you can think about your week coming up. And let's just pray and ask God that in those moments where, where we're going to hear the whisper of the Spirit, we'll say yes. Father, Thank you so much for this community that you've created. God, I thank you for everybody in the room, those who have trusted you and have been walking this path and are exhibiting this fruit. They've been doing it for a long time. I'm so grateful for their example. For those of us who are trying, we're in the war. We feel that war uh, intensely. Would you let the voice of the Spirit just be louder? Would you give us that grace? That this week we, we might hear it and, and have the courage to respond to it. Lord, I pray that you would develop this fruit in us. Like, would you be so good that the next chapter of St. Andrews is one where we're sure you do great things among us and, and the miraculous continues to happen, but it would be the kind of place where people on the outside look and say, I've never seen a group that's more joyful, that's more patient, that's more gentle, that's more kind, that's more forgiving, that's more loving, that's more peaceful when the world is not. 
God, and you would just use that to draw people to yourself. But it starts with me. It starts with my friends in these seats. So would you remind us of what we have in you? Let us feel the empowerment of your spirit coursing through our veins, through our hearts today. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen.